welcome to my youtube channel once again if this is your first time on this channel thank you so much for stopping by and if you are a returning subscriber you know what i say <laughs> i've got a huge space in my heart for you guys i really do thank you so much for liking my videos for sharing for subscribing listen the last time i checked we were at 521 subscribers and my goodness my gosh you guys are doing the things you are really really blessing my heart so thank you so much for liking thank you for sharing thank you for subscribing have you clicked that notification bell though listen we want to build a notification gang now if you are not a youtuber like you're not a person that loves to watch youtube videos <laughs> like me then you're like what is the notification gang listen the notification gang are those people who get a notification every time i upload my video and you want to do that so that you can watch it you can be one of the first people to watch a video every time i upload it so make sure that you click the little bell somewhere on the bottom right of this video make sure you click that so that you get a notification every time i upload a video okay let's get into what we are doing today it is the first friday of this month so if you are an og subscriber you know what that means it means that we do a teaching video so welcome to faithful fridays this is most likely going to be up on the first friday of july and i want to thank god for preserving your life i want to thank god for preserving my life i want to thank him for keeping us and bringing us this far into this year and i want to thank him in faith for all the things that are yet to come all the things that he has in store for us for the rest of this year i know i'm talking at super speed <laughs> it just means that i'm super excited because i really believe that i've got a word for somebody i really believe that this time's video this month's video teaching video is really going to be a blessing for somebody it has blessed me and i'm trusting god that it's going to bless you as well so today we are talking about sin yes we're talking about sin you messed up i messed up you know somebody that messed up this video is for you i really believe that this is a word for somebody who's saying you know what i was doing things right i was walking with god i was you know like um bagging it with my quiet times every day and all of that and then all of a sudden i messed up i did this big bad thing that is really shaming me that is giving me a lot of guilt and i'm struggling to get up from it i'm struggling to find myself back in god again i'm struggling to find myself back in church again i don't know what it is that you did maybe you slept with someone maybe you stole something maybe you lied maybe you have just been walking in a lot of pride i don't know what it is but i believe that this word is going to be for you because what i want to tell you today is that don't let your sin define you you've got to make sure that you rise above from that thing and today that's what we're talking about how can you rise above how can you get up from this place where you had messed up from this place where things were going well in your relationship with god and and then you do something that really makes you feel unworthy to continue to walk with him that really makes you feel dirty and really like the worst of the worst i want you to know that you can get up from that thing you do not have to let your sin define you and you might be thinking this hun is just talking she don't know what she's talking about let us get into the word of god because we have a perfect example of somebody who was in a situation like yours somebody who really messed up and somebody who when we read their story when we read what we're about to read now in the word you would think oh my gosh this was going to be the end of him because he really messed up he messed up like big time um but he got up from it and that is what i want to encourage you with today to say you can get up from your sin so let us get into the bible um and if you have your phone your bible turn with me click with me flip with me do whatever you gotta do to make sure that you get into the word and we are in second samuel chapter 11 i'm reading from the new living translation read in whatever version version is your favorite whatever version you like let's do this the bible says i'm going to read from verse one to five stop and then we're going to read a little bit more stop and then i'm going to read a little bit more okay verse number one the bible says in the spring of the year when kings normally go out to war david sent joab and the israelite army to fight the ammonites they destroyed the ammonite army and laid siege to the city of rabbah however David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. 
As he looked out, out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. If I was in church, I would say unusual beauty and I would have you repeat that. But he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant, my gosh. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Your word is so powerful. I pray that you would just breathe over this message that I have prepared for whoever is watching this video today. Thank you so much for ministering to me through this. And I pray that um, as I speak and minister to others, may you truly be the one that is ministering to each and every person watching this video. God, I pray that this video would be the strength, the empowerment that somebody needs to rise up out of their guilt, out of their shame, and to begin to walk with you in relationship again, in intimacy again, in fellowship with you, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you are a God of restoration. Thank you that you are a God that desires that we would walk with you. Thank you that you make our sins, you, you, you give us a blank slate, a clean slate, and you wash away our sins and, and you make us white as snow. I pray that this video would be the encouragement that somebody needs, that this word would be a life-giving word to somebody, that it would be what they need to raise them out of the pit of depression that they've been in, out of the pit of sorrow and grief that they have been in, oh God, and that it would be what they need to propel them into relationships with you again into fellowship with you again thank you for your love thank you for your restoration thank you for this word in the mighty name of your son yeshua the christ amen and amen listen you've got to stop me when i am super excited like you really i don't know you've got to give me a pill or something to really slow down my speed i'm trying <laughs> i'm gonna try and speak at a normal human pace but this word is really um bubbling up on the inside of me so we just read about David and if you are not familiar with this story um, then this might have been your first time hearing it but basically we just read that David has this encounter where he goes up he's walking on the top of his roof and he sees this really beautiful woman and um, he desires her he lusts over her he desires her and then they end up sleeping together and he impregnates this woman that is not just a woman but this is somebody else's wife all right now the husband Uriah is out in battle and so we see from verse 6, six to 13 what happens. We're not going to read it. But basically, David sends for Uriah once he hears that Bathsheba is pregnant. He sends for Uriah and says, please bring him. Um, and he tries to convince him to go to his house to sleep with his wife. So that ultimately, you know, because she's pregnant, the claim can then be that it was, you know, the husband that impregnated his wife. But we know that that's not what happened. It was David that slept with her. So Uriah refuses because basically, he's saying this doesn't make sense to me like my fellow soldiers are still out in battle they're still out on the battlefield and I should be sleeping in the comfort of my home I'm not gonna do that so he doesn't go home David tries again he tries to invite him to dinner he tries to get him drunk so that he can go home and sleep with his wife but Uriah refuses and he doesn't go home he doesn't sleep with his wife and so now David is kind of stuck in this place like oh my gosh what am I gonna do now because he's his plan was for his for him to sleep with his wife but that doesn't happen so let's see what happens next so we're gonna read I'm gonna take it from verse 14 which is after what I've just explained happens. Uriah refuses to go and sleep with his wife. Um, so then verse 14. So he, Uriah now goes back to the battlefield. Verse 14. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. So Joab is like the commander of the army. The letter instructed Joab, station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest. Then pull back that he will be killed. So Joab assigned Uriah to spot, uh, to spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest were fighting, uh, where the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy's soldiers came out to the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with the other, with several other Israelite soldiers. Now, what is happening here? 
Literally, David is the one that murders Uriah because he's the one that instructs that Joab should put him in the front of the battlefield and that he should get killed. Because obviously now David is in the state of panic. Oh my goodness, Uriah is going to find out that I slept with his wife and that I've impregnated his wife. And to avoid all of that, I'm going to just make sure that he gets killed. That's what sin does to us. The moment that we start, we've got to find all these other things that we need to do. And we just keep finding ourselves getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in sin. That might be you today, but this is an encouraging word. You're going to walk away from this video feeling encouraged, feeling that you don't have to be stuck in the pit of the sins that you may have found yourself in. So now we can see from this text um, that David literally... Um, committed many many sins okay there's so much there's so much that he's done in this text i mean he's basically lusted over a woman he's committed adultery he slept with her he impregnated someone else's wife he lied to uriah he has done so many things and you would think this is going to be the end of this person this is a king and he's done all of these things um and we know that david had this beautiful <coughs> beginning excuse me he had this big be beautiful beginning um he starts off and we know him to be the one that defeats Goliath and we he becomes king and all these beautiful things and then all of a sudden we have this big bad thing that happens to him and that might be you today maybe you are a pastor of a church maybe you are a leader of a church maybe I don't know what position you have or what the beginning of your story your relationship with God has looked like maybe you're the one that everybody looks up to and yet you are struggling with one particular thing you may be like David but you know what this sin that David committed did not define him the interesting thing I think that we see about David is that even though all of these things happened even though he committed adultery even though he murdered someone even though he slept with someone else's wife we know these things about him but a lot of times we still know David to be the person that is called the one after God's own heart that means that the sin that he committed did not define him now listen I'm not saying that there are no consequences for the sin that we commit there definitely is there definitely are consequences that we experience for the sin that we commit but one thing that we can be assured of is that once we repent, once we are walking with God, those sins are, when he says that he washes them white as snow, he literally does that. We do not have to be defined by our sins. So we see that David does all these crazy things. He does all these things that if it was you and I, we would say, bro, we're kicking you out. Bro, you no longer have the right to be called the person after God's own heart. Bro, we're not going to make mention of your songs. If I had a choice, I probably like after hearing this about David, I would have been like, uh-uh, he's not worthy, you know, to have anything that he's written be in the Bible. And yet we still have the Psalms. And many of those were written by David. Your sin does not have to define you. David's sin did not define him. Now, when you sin you can either be Judas or you can be Peter you know both of these people denied Christ Judas is we know we know Judas the betrayer we know his story but what ends up happening with Judas his sin is so much for him it really grieves him so much he's filled with so much grief and um, he's so ashamed he has so much sorrow so much so that he decides to just take his life Peter, on the other hand, he denies Jesus three times and he also experiences guilt and shame for all of that. But you know what? He surrenders that and he then continues to serve Christ. He continues to live for Christ. So you have a choice to make. You may have messed up. Yes. Acknowledge the fact that you've messed up. Acknowledge that. Come before God and acknowledge I messed up. But you have a choice. You can either choose that to be the end of your story, the end of your life, and you can be like, I'm never going to step in church again because I messed up. I'm never going to read the word again because I'm so unwell worthy i'm so unholy or you can choose to be like peter and and repent and surrender and say god i messed up you were right when you said i was gonna mess up i did mess up you know because the truth is god knows that we're gonna mess up and yet he chooses us anyway god knows that we are not perfect and yet he chooses us anyway that is why christ died for us because ultimately he knew that we are sinful like our nature is sinful so what I'm trying to tell you this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever time you're watching this video, is that you don't have to let your sin define you. You can you can choose to be like Peter, who sinned, he messed up, he did this big, big, bad, horrible thing, but he rose above. He rose from it. He returned like the prodigal son, you know, the prodigal son returns to his father. He realizes, you know what, I have a father. He doesn't say, I messed up, I squandered my um, inheritance, and I did all of these things. 
he says i did all of those things i acknowledge that i did all of those things but let me go back to my father's house i pray that this video would be what you need this morning this afternoon this evening i gotta make sure that i i say that because i don't know what time you're going to be watching this but um I hope that you'll be like the prodigal son today. I hope that this message will be what propels you to say, I've got to go back to my father's presence. I've got to go back. I'm not going to allow myself to keep living in this pit of depression that I've been in, in this pit of grief and sorrow over my sin that I've been in. I'm going to go back to my father's presence. Yes, you should feel bad for your sin. You should feel bad. You should feel sad that I've messed up. I shouldn't have done what I did. The Bible tells us that godly sorrow leads to repentance. So you should feel bad because you have done something bad. You have displeased God. And when we see, let's let's read quickly the end of the story of David and, and Uriah and Bathsheba. What ends up happening? When we read verse 26 and 27, this is the end of the story. After Uriah has died, um, the Bible then says, When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. The Bible says that the Lord was displeased with what David had done, which means he really did mess up. He did something that didn't make God happy. And that's what happens when you and I fall into sin, when we do something that is not right. We really do displease the Lord. But that doesn't have to be the end of the story for you. And we're going to see how even for David, that was not the case. He realized that he messed up, but that did not define him. May your sin not define you. So how do we do this? You might be listening to me and you might be sitting there and thinking, okay, I hear you, sis, you know, I hear you. I shouldn't let this define me, but how do I practically get up from this place that I'm in? How do I practically, like the prodigal son, leave my sin and say, I'm going back to my father's house or leave where I am or leave this pit of depression, of sorrow. How do I leave this and go back to my father's home? First thing I want to tell you, rest in relationship. Yes, <laughs> you can take a pause, breathe on that, think on that, literally take that in, rest in relationship. What does that mean? You've got to rest in the fact that you have a solid relationship with God. A lot of times what the enemy will try to do when you sin is try to make you think you have no standing with God anymore. He'll try to make you think that God has forsaken you. He'll try to make you think that you it's over for you. You no longer saved. You no longer have a calling, a purpose. You no longer have the right to talk about Jesus. You no longer have the you're not clean enough to step into church. He will really try to strip you of everything. He will try to strip you of your identity as a child of God. But once you are a child of God, you are a child of God. Like the prodigal son, again, he realized I have a father, which means that he's a son, no matter what it is that he has done. God has not disowned you because of your sin but you've got to rest in that a lot of times we don't a lot of times we are so consumed with our guilt with our shame that we don't rest in the fact that you have a relationship with God so rest in the fact that you have a relationship with God what does that look like you know before I before I explain what that looks like it's like a husband and a wife have a fight and then the next morning the wife has packed up all her clothes and she goes back to her mother's house Everybody would be like, sis, what's going on? What you doing? <laughs> what's going on with you? The truth of the matter is she probably thought, oh my gosh, you know, I was in the wrong. Maybe she yelled at her husband. Maybe she messed up and they got into this big bad fight and she decides I'm no longer worthy to be this man's husband and she leaves. But they got into a covenant relationship and that means for better or for worse. That means even when we fight, even when I mess up, the husband is not going to disown her and say, you're no longer my wife and vice versa. They are in this thing for better or for worse. They're in this thing for life. They made a covenant relationship. That is what has happened with you and God. When you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you made a covenant relationship with him. That thing is not going to be destroyed because you messed up today. Hello, somebody. That was the word that somebody needed to know. You're thinking that, oh my gosh, this sin that I've committed is going to remove the covenant relationship that I have with God. No, you've got to realize that it is the blood of Jesus that makes you worthy of his presence. It is the blood of Jesus that allows you to draw into the presence of the Father. So that very thing is what's going to sustain you, is what's going to keep you rest in relationship. Resting in relationship means um, even though I've messed up, I know that God and I have a real relationship. That means I can talk to him even after messing up. 
Let's see what David did. So when you read 2 Samuel chapter 12, you see this whole interaction between Nathan, the prophet of the Lord, and David. And David basically um, has this issue where basically he realizes, I messed up, I impregnated this woman, she now has a child, and this child, he fasts, he prays for this child because this child is going to die. And he's asking God, Lord, please have mercy. I know I messed up, but I want this child not to die. You see, the mere fact that David goes back to God and starts to talk to God um, means that he was not so taken up by his sin that he couldn't talk to God anymore. A lot of times that's what happens with you and I. We mess up and we think, oh my gosh, I can't talk to God anymore because we're not resting in relationship. We think that our relationship with God is determined or it rises and falls based on our shortcomings, but it doesn't. You can, you can quote that, you can quote it, quote me on that. <laughs> your relationship with God does not rise and fall on your shortcomings. God knows that you're going to fall. God knows you're going to sin. You can come back to him and talk to him. So rest in relationship. Know that, okay, I sinned, I messed up. That doesn't mean I can't pray anymore. That doesn't mean I can't talk to God anymore. Actually, he invites us to come to him and tell him, I messed up, this is what I did. He invites us, he tells us that we can talk. So we see David in Psalm 51, we see David in 2 Samuel chapter 12. He still talks to God, even though he had messed up. So don't allow the enemy to make you think that you can no longer talk to God, you can no longer pray, you can no longer approach the presence of God because you have sinned. So number one, rest in relationship. Number two, you've got to repent. Yes, that word that maybe we don't like to hear. The truth of the matter is you've got to repent. You've got to confess your sin. You've got to acknowledge that I messed up. Now I want us to read Psalm 51, which is the psalm that David writes right after he has had this whole encounter and he's basically asking God for forgiveness. So let's read Psalm 51 verse 4. Or actually, before we read Psalm 51, let's read 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. Because this is where we see that same story. Now Nathan has come and David is going to acknowledge, he's going to confess that I messed up. So he says in verse 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, the Bible says, Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. So we see David repenting, we see David confessing that I have sinned, I messed up, I really did something that didn't please God. Now in Psalm 51 verse 4, we see David in a similar light. He is now going to say, Lord, forgive me. It's so important for us not just to rest in relationship. You see, when you rest in relationship, this is what gives you the power to repent. Because if you don't rest in relationship, you think I can't even talk to God. So even saying sorry, you have this whole battle in your mind. You're like, God, I feel so unworthy to even say sorry, to even talk to you. So you don't even apologize for your sin. You don't even confess that you sinned or you messed up because you are not resting in relationship. You think that your relationship has been destroyed. So that's why I didn't mention repenting first. I mentioned resting in relationship first because it comes from that place when you know that I'm still in relationship with God that you can go back and repent like that illustration that I gave of the man and the woman that fight and have an argument if it is that security that the woman has that this is for life no matter what I do no matter what happens in this relationship him and I made a covenant that we would be with each other for better or for worse that allows that woman not to leave not to say I've been disowned, not to pack up her bags the next day because she is secure in the fact that I've got a covenant relationship with this person. So you've got to rest in relationship so that you are then propelled to repent. So Psalm 51 verse number 4. Psalm 51 verse 4, the Bible says, Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. So David is confessing. He's saying, God, I messed up and I'm so sorry that I messed up. That is what you and I need to do. We've got to come to a place where we say, God, I messed up. I'm so sorry for what I did. Please forgive me for what I, I did. And when you read the whole of the Psalm, you see David repeatedly confessing his sin. You see David repeatedly asking for forgiveness. You see David repeatedly acknowledging, embracing, accepting the fact that he messed up. Don't be too prideful and say, you know what, it's okay. <laughs> I was born a sinner anyway. You know, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. And then you're just so prideful and walking in that thing that you're like, well, it's whatever. You know, this teaching is not that when I say don't let your sin define you I don't mean don't acknowledge the fact that you sinned I don't mean you know just yeah like graze over it like it's nothing it's not nothing you did mess up it is something that displeased the Lord so acknowledge it accept it humble yourself before God and ask for his forgiveness now 
sometimes our sin is against other people as well so you have a responsibility to apologize to those people the bible tells us in james that we are to confess our sins one to another so it's important for you not just to confess before god not just to repent but even after that to allow the holy spirit to lead you and to help you to go and ask for forgiveness from whoever it is that you wronged maybe you didn't speak well to somebody maybe you lied to someone maybe you stole something that belonged to somebody else maybe you got into a really nasty argument with someone i don't know what it is but maybe you're in a place where you need to confess confess your sin to somebody else that you wronged you need to do that so we're saying step number two how you're going to make sure that your sin does not define you after you have rested in relationship repent talk to god about it confess your sin and then go to your brother or your sister who you may have wronged and tell them i'm so sorry for this thing please forgive me and finally number three refuse to return You've got to make a decision in your mind that I'm not going back to this thing. I messed up, I sinned, I did something really bad, I'm not going back. You've got to make a commitment. You have got to make a resolve in your mind that I'm not going back. You've got to refuse to return. You've got to make a commitment with yourself. I'm not going to keep doing this thing. I'm not going to find myself back in this place. Lord, please help me. Please give me the strength to make sure that I don't get back to this place. You've got to do whatever you've got to do to make sure that you don't go back find an accountability partner. I highly advocate for that because sometimes we don't want to tell somebody else that you're messing up. But if you have somebody that you can trust, a mentor, a brother or sister in Christ, somebody in the church, maybe even your parents if you have that kind of a relationship with them, somebody that you can trust to say, please keep me accountable. I don't want to find myself back in this place. You've got to make a resolve, a commitment to say, I am not going back. Refuse to return. Let's look at the Bible. Second, Timothy 2 verse 22, it tells us to flee, it tells us to run from every form of youthful lust. So literally run, literally turn away, literally do what you've got to do to make sure you don't find yourself back in that place. In Matthew, Jesus tells the disciples to pray that they would not fall into temptation. So keep praying. You've sinned. You've messed up. Keep yourself in a place of prayer. Keep yourself in a place where you are surrounded by people that are in the presence of God so that you don't find yourself in temptation, so that you don't find yourself falling back into the sins that had trapped you the first time. So refuse to return. Make a resolve in your mind that I'm not going back. Back. And finally, Psalm 51, verse 12 to 14. I thought that it would be so key for us to, to end this teaching here because David does the same thing. He refuses to return. He does something that says that God, because you have forgiven me, because I have been taken out of this thing, I'm going to do everything I've got to do to make sure that I don't find myself back in this place. So Psalm 51, verse 12. Psalm 51, verse 12, the Bible says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. 13, then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. 14, forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. So David says he's going to teach other people about God's ways after God has forgiven him. He is making a commitment to say, I'm going to do something that's going to keep me busy. I'm going to do something that's going to testify of your goodness. I'm going to do something that's going to make sure that I don't find myself back in that place that I was in. You have got to make a resolve. You've got to say, okay, God, I messed up. I'm so sorry, but please forgive me. And when you forgive me, this is what I'm going to do. God, when you forgive me, this is what I'm committing to do. I'm going to get an accountability partner. I'm going to start serving in the church again. I'm going to start doing things that will make you active, things that will make you be found in a place where you are not in an... You know that saying that says that the devil, the, the, an idle mind is the devil's playground? Something along those lines. Uh, I don't think it's an actual biblical verse. I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Maybe I don't know my Bible well enough. <laughs> I don't know. It's not. Okay. It's not. Um, but it's a saying, right? Which literally means that when you're idle, when you're not doing anything, as they say, your mind is really open for you to now start finding yourself to doing things that you shouldn't be doing in the first place. So that's what I'm trying to say. That's the point that I'm trying to drill is to say, refuse to return, make a resolve, do something that will keep you away from getting back to the place that you had found yourself in. So one, rest in relationship, two, repent, and three, refuse to return. And this is how you make sure that your sin does not 
not define you. You sinned, you messed up, but you know what? Forgiveness is waiting for you. God is literally right there with you. His promise to never leave you nor forsake you literally was him saying that I will be with you for better or for worse. Meaning that you're not only supposed to show up in the better, you're supposed to show up even in the worse because he shows up even in the worse. So when you've messed up, when you've sinned, God doesn't flee. God doesn't say you're no longer my child. God doesn't say I don't want anything to do with you anymore. He shows up in that moment of your worst and you're supposed to show up too. So I really hope that this video blessed you. I really hope that this word was an encouragement to you. I pray that in this month of July, if this video was relevant for you, that you would find yourself leaping out of that place of sorrow, leaping out of that place of grief, leaping out of that place of embarrassment and shame and that place where you've been telling yourself that I'm never going to go back to Christ or I'm never going to go back to the church because I messed up so bad. It is a lie from the enemy. There are consequences for your sin, yes, but there's so much forgiveness, there's so much grace, there's so much that God still has in store for you even though you messed up and you can be like David who was an adulterer a murderer but is still known as the man after God's own heart so you could have messed up I don't know in what way but I want you to know that that doesn't have to define you I really hope that this video has blessed you and if it da if it has <laughs> if it has blessed you please comment in the section down below let me know what has blessed you about this video please share it with your with a friend who might be going through something and really needs to hear this video or like this video share it uh, tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend that we are back next month with another word from the lord by faith <laughs> i'm trusting that god will give me another word for the month of august all right guys thank you so much for watching this video bye and god bless you